When I think about the terminology, am I my brother's keeper, I started to question myself, well, who is my brother? Is my brother someone that is related to me biologically? Is my brother someone who fellowships with me? Or does that expand out into the community? Well, as I was reflecting on this particular topic, I too got involved with the committee that's planning the upcoming Martin Luther King celebration for the university in January. And uh, the gentleman that we were talking with uh, around the community brought in Dr. King's letter from a Birmingham jail. Hadn't read that in a long time. And so we read a portion of it, and there was a quote that stuck out in there to me. And I'm going to use that particular quote. And in that context is where I'd like to start our discussion tonight on Am I My Brother's Keeper? Now, Dr. King was being jailed because he had gone down to Birmingham from Atlanta to help out. Uh, they were in distress. There was a lot of injustice taking place, if you will. And so Dr. King was called upon to come down and lend his brothers in Alabama a hand. And he was jailed. And so while he was imprisoned, he penned a letter to his captors, if you will, that is 10 pages long, so I won't read the whole thing, but just a quote. And in it, um, he said to them as they questioned, why are you here? Why did you come from Atlanta to Birmingham? He said, because I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. How do you see faith and your particular faith, tradition, or its institutions caring for our brothers. We're going to use that to go around the room and start a discussion, but prior to that, we had two brave students, the co-presidents of the Interfaith Council, to already prepare a response to our question of the evening. So I'd like to ask Jordan and Amir to come up, please. And if you would share with us what you will all pull together based on this question, and then we'll build off of what you said. Come on up. Uh, good evening. Again, my name is Jordan, um, and I'm, I'd like to talk a little bit about an experience I had a few weeks ago um, where I was engaged with, um, with a couple different faith communities on campus, um, and what, what that evening sort of taught me about the, the role of um, uh, faith in, in serving community and kind of um, making sure that we take care of our our brothers in, in other faith communities, even, even um, here on campus. Um, and so I guess to, to first answer Wendy's question, the word that came to mind for me um, is solidarity. And I think from what I know, that's, um, that word comes from Catholicism or the, the Catholic um, tradition um, originally. It's one we hear a lot now um, in, in discourse about social justice and things like that, um, but it, it's about standing with those, with anyone, um, especially those who, who, are, who are less fortunate. Um, it, it goes beyond, I think, the idea of men and women for others. Uh, it's, it's rather men and women with others. Um, and, and I know that's a distinction that, that um, we, try, we try to make. Um, and so I, I um, a few weeks ago, was at um, a banquet with the Muslim Students Association um, for the celebration of, of the end of the month of um, Ramadan, the Eid al-Fitr banquet. Um, and I was lucky to sit next to um, Georgetown's retired rabbi, Rabbi Harold White. And um, he and I were talking for a long time, and um, we got to a discussion about his time when he first came to Georgetown um, and how the school has changed so much since then and how the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, have changed a lot since then. Um, and he's going on and on about, um, about the number of Jesuits that were here in the Maryland um, province 
in the 60s versus the number that there are now um, and, and how that number's decreased and what a tragedy that is and how important it is that we need to really strengthen the society of Jesus. And as he's saying this, I realized, wait a minute, this isn't a Jesuit that is worried about the society of Jesus. This is a rabbi who's worried, a Jew who's worried about the society of Jesus dwindling. Um, and for me, that was a really powerful statement um, and expression of solidarity. Um, rabbi White is, is an amazing man who actually, I think, met Dr. King um, and um, studied under Abraham Joshua Heschel, um, who, who was a... Uh, um, who also worked, worked alongside King and who, who said something to the extent of, um, you know, when he was talking about the March on Washington, I felt like I was praying with my feet. Um, and so that interaction with Rabbi White um, was very powerful for me. And um, later that evening, I went to um, mat, nightly mass um, here at Georgetown um, in, in Copley Crypt Chapel. And um, I, not ironically enough, um, but coincidentally, the, the gospel reading, or maybe it was um, the first reading, was about um, how we all, in our diversity, make up the body of Christ, um, and how important all of our different um, our differences are in in um, creating this um, this body. And, and Father Spawn, who who was um, saying the mass. Um, was talking about this 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 concept of mutuality and and dependency um, that we have that we have um, uh, among one another um, and that our differences are, are complementary and um, I became kind of emotional because um, I've really experienced that dependency in my own experience here at Georgetown, I really credit the Muslim community for helping me to re-embrace my own Catholicism. Um, and so thinking about the fact that the Muslim students on the other side of the, the wall in, in Copley, so in Copley you've got the, the chapel and literally next door um, is the Muslim prayer room. Um, and at 10 p.m. the Muslims are always in there praying. And sometimes I can hear um, the call to prayer through the wall. Um, and so for me, realizing how much I owed the Muslim community for the fact that I was sitting in mass um, was really, was powerful. Um, and so for me that, that whole evening um, spoke to, to the importance of just up, the fact that we have to be our brother's keeper here on campus. Um, and I'll leave you with one other short um, anecdote from that evening. Um, I ran into one of my Muslim friends after the banquet, um, and he's like, it's so good to have you back on campus. I was abroad in the spring, and he, um, he said, it just felt like there was a hole when you weren't here. Um, and that was, I mean, the, the nicest thing he could have said, um, but I, I also realized that without that community, there would have been a real hole in, in, my, um, in my spiritual life and life, especially at Georgetown, um, because it was through engaging with the Muslims that I ultimately um, came back to my Catholic faith, which I hadn't been too sure about before. So first, thank you again for being here today. And uh, one thing I th really thought of when you mentioned the word is the narrative of uh, religious cooperation, because we know right now in our country, the narrative of religious cooperation isn't really the strongest voice. And we've seen over the past couple of weeks, there have been like violent protests in the Middle East, there have been attacks on communities in America, shootings, and all of this is around faith. And people think that faith can only be divisive, it can't do anything, but this is not what we want to do. This is, it, we are our brother's keepers because if we don't do that, someone else will have a narrative where religion is only violent and can't do anything good. And the fact that all of us are sitting here know right now that we know religion can be a unifying force. And it's up to us to make that the dominant narrative in America right now. So Georgetown is pretty uniquely seated to this task. We have the Jesuit values that pretty much affirm values constant in every tradition, whether it's men and women for others or faith and justice. And these ideas help us realize we can find common ground on community service and through interfaith dialogue. Over the past month, a lot of clubs on campus have done the 25 days of service, which encourages student groups who don't normally work together to partner together and pursue uh, community service in DC um, every day for 25 days. And a large number of people um, are participating in the Interfaith Council's dialogue program, which De Jesse coordinates. And the point of this is to help people have religion, um, to bring religion more into the conversation. That program is called Faith in Conversation. We break students into groups of three or four, 
and they meet over the course of the semester and try to form more personal relationships with people who are different than them. And one thing that you'll notice also is that you'll see the same people coming to all of our events. And uh, we definitely noticed this last year. And people will criticize us saying that interfaith cooperation only preaches to the choir. Interfaith is a niche activity, it'll never have mainstream appeal, and it's too divisive to have any positive impact. And to these people, I say, look at a case study of Georgetown. So here's a story of what happened at Georgetown and how we can basically take an um, example from this. A few weeks ago, an organization launched a series of hateful Islamophobic advertisements in the DC Metro. In response, Georgetown students of many faiths have begun a large campaign to counter Islamophobia in general, not just in DC, but for the whole nation. The Interfaith Council, the Jewish and Muslim chaplaincies, and various other student groups are working together. Georgetown students have designed their own advertisements to distribute in the DC Metro, which promote peace and tolerance. In response to the inflammatory YouTube video, which we have seen cause a lot of problems, Georgetown students are working on their own video, which highlights the positive aspects of Prophet Muhammad and wants to show America and the world what Muslims really believe. Many student groups have specifically focused on expanding their dialogue efforts and aim at eliminating, eliminating misconceptions. This campaign against Islamophobia is just getting off the ground, but it is a potential to be a model for the nation. Georgetown is a unique place where interfaith activities are already the norm. Now it is up to us to engage with other communities in DC and communities around the nation. By showcasing the uniting potential of religion, we are truly in a position to change that narrative of religious conflict into one of cooperation. Uh, so to conclude, I'll, con I'll say one of my favorite quotes from the Quran. Quran chapter 41, verse 34. Virtue and evil are not equal. If you repel evil with what is better, you will find that your enemies will become your friends. Thank you. Anyone else have something they'd like to share regarding your experience? What's your experience been maybe with your own faith institution or in the communities where you've come from? What have you seen? What, what role is being taken to care for our brothers, to keep our brothers, if you will. Anyone? Yes. Well, as I mentioned before, I was, I was agnostic. And I believed that there was some sort of higher power, but not necessarily uh, believed that Jesus was the son of God and things like that. But um, a couple of my friends are Christian. And so I decided to uh, just go, go to a Bible study and just to you know, learn a little bit more about what, it, what Christianity really was, what religion was, since a lot of what I saw in the, in the media and a lot of what I read, it's always saying, you know, religion does all these bad things. Mm -hmm. And so I was, um, you know, I had a skewed kind of prejudice. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to, to actually understand and learn what was the truth. So I went to the, the Bible study and I told them from the beginning I wasn't a practicing Christian, I wasn't Christian. But they were a very welcoming community and they, they accepted me anyway. And um, I'm, a, I'm a freshman and we're about halfway through the semester. And even so, I'm, I've never been very good at making friends and um, just connecting with other people. So, but going to this, this Bible study, even one that is not of my faith, they provided a lot of support. Mm -hmm. they, they felt compassion for me, mm -hmm. and I, I drew strength from that, and I drew confidence from that, and I'm you know, very glad that, as a community, they were there for me. Boy, that sounds like faith in action to me. That's awesome. I was diagnosed with this condition in my knees, and um, so it made like, going to class really hard for me. So you know, I had to be on a wheelchair, and my brother, um, my brother, literally, he's been helping me, you know, go to class, like, you know, he's been pushing the wheelchair and stuff. So, um, so, in a way, he's been keeping me, but now, um, so then, you know, in order to be independent, I actually, um, talked to, to, um, the clinic, and they actually get, got me an electric wheelchair and a power chair. So now I'm, now I'm independent, and I, I can be on my own. Mm -hmm. So, so that's basically, like, you know, mm -hmm. you know, in the grand scheme of things, you need, you need to kind of get that independence and, like not literally keep your brother forever and then just get them to what needs to do what they want The whole idea and premise around this topic was just about us getting to a place where, you know, one day we're not categorizing ourselves as this group and that group and this subgroup and that group, but that we're all one, we're all part 
of a single garment of destiny, like Dr. King talked about, and this idea that we are here to serve one another, that we are, in essence, our brother's keeper, not necessarily forever, but for a time, because any one of us could find ourselves in a position where we might need to be kept. And it humbles us and keeps us in a place where we understand that I'm helping you because I never know when there might be a time where I might need to pick up the phone and give you a call and say, hey, can you help me out? <laughs>